Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Casual Criminalist. List, this one, Christmas Special, which I'm recording on the 24th of November. Christmas seems like a very long way away. But by the time you hear this, ho, 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 uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night, the Kavina Christmas Massacre. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. It's time for murder or massacre. Thank you, Matt, for putting it together. Let's jump in. Now I have a machine gun. It's the most wonderful time of year, outside of the wallets of parents, that is. It's a time for friends and family, goodwill, snow, caroling, and plenty of presents. In our house, Christmas has always been a fun time for the family, even after my father passed on three years ago. Oh, I'm sorry, Matt. It's been about us spending time together, putting up a tree, a real tree, the plastic crab, and... Uh... <laughs> I have a plastic tree. We have this, like, hyper-realistic looking plastic one that was a little bit pricey, but then it means I don't have to buy a Christmas tree every year, and also... I always feel a bit sad for Christmas trees because I'm like, they chop down all these trees while they're all young. And then I know it's stupid because I like eat meat and stuff, but it's like, just seems like a bit wasteful. Like we're always told like, save the environment. It's like, yeah, but we'll harvest all these trees. And then it drops the needles and then it's dead. And you're like, oh, that's a shame. So yeah, no, I'm a plastic, I'm a plastic tree man. And decorating it with all our old ornaments, along with the ones that we personally made over the years. We even make the effort to go to my aunt and uncle's house in Jersey to have a nice family dinner on Christmas Eve, doing our best to go almost every year. The next morning, we'd wake up, open our presents. Hell, I'll never forget my brother's face when he opened up a PS5 for the first time, as we had all agreed to keep it a surprise from him. Whoa, that's a dope Christmas gift. Then we had a nice big breakfast, usually my mum's famous French toast with a side of bacon and eggs, and we all enjoy our gifts. I get the feeling that Matt's just telling me this story, because he's gonna get, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then some other people celebrate it with a massacre. As for traditions, my family doesn't really have many, though if going to see one final movie for the year with my brother at some point in the day counts, I'll certainly take it. That definitely counts. So how are we gonna spoil Christmas this year? <laughs> I knew it was coming. Well, we're going to talk about mass murder, of course, and the, at the hands of Chris Kringle. Yes, that's right, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about a man who, after being pushed to the brink, took the time to get the full Santa costume, beard and all, and embark on the vengeful slaughter of those that he once held dear. That Christmas Eve, Bruce Jeffrey Pardo killed a total of nine people, along with injuring three others, all because he believed his life was in tatters. Talk about a bloody bad Christmas. Yeah, like, if your life is in tatters, like, I don't mean to be harsh... But, uh, you know, there is, you could go on, on, a, on a massacre where the only victim is yourself. How about that? Rather than, like, killing nine other people. If your life is in tatters. Like, obviously, if your life is in tatters, get some help. Don't, like, oh God, I'm digging a hole, aren't I? But you know what I mean? How about you don't kill other people? How about you just don't? And don't kill yourself. Just get some help. Stop it. Get some help. So everyone, gather round as we spin you a dark tale of a Christmas Eve plunged into chaos and despair. The tale of a Santa hellbent on killing as sadly a few lumps of coal simply didn't suffice in his twisted mind. So let's travel back in time to Covina, California in 2008 and let's speak of a night filled with gunfire and flames. A night that would taint what should be a night of happiness and joy forevermore. A night that shows sometimes family just isn't enough. Oh, and for our eagle-eared listeners, you might have picked up on the fact that I said we. Well, there's quite a simple explanation for that. You see, Simon, I've prepared a little surprise for you. A present, if you will. Or should I say, we have a present for you. Okay, so Emma, Matthew, and Liam, let's tell us a story. Okay, what's going on? Like, I don't read these ahead of time, just in case you hadn't picked up on that. And Emma, Matthew, and Liam are other regular contributors to the Casual Criminals. There are two Matthews. But, okay, what's going on? Here in the Southern Hemisphere, we celebrate a sunny, blazing hot Christmas filled with a sense of sun, lotion, chlorine, and bry flays. This must be Emma, who lives in South Africa, because that's the Southern Hemisphere, and it's hot, and a bry is like a South African barbecue, if I'm not mistaken. The celebrations usually start around the 24th of September eh, of December, sorry, and in my family at least, we eat a light dinner and hold a small service, during which I read the story of Jesus' birth from the Bible as a reminder that he was God's gift to mankind, and then we hand gifts out to each other in turn. The rest of the night is then spent eating candy and admiring our gifts, and afterwards we go to bed. The next day we go to church in the morning and spend the day relaxing at home, stuffing ourselves on the Christmas feast. It's not exactly the white Christmas we usually see on TV, but some American traditions have influenced our own. We also have a Christmas 
Christmas tree, a Christmas pudding, and a Santa. When I was seven, we had the whole family over for Christmas, and I remember that all the cousins had to go outside after dinner and call him over. Then a bearded Santa came waltzing down the darkened driveway in his red Santa suit, a bag slung over his shoulder, and we all gathered around him in the living room. <laughs> Must be like wearing that Southern Hemisphere Christmas. It's, like, it's bloody hot in this Santa suit. We weren't idiots, and we knew that Santa wasn't real, so we studied him in earnest as he handed out presents. The trick, always figuring out which one of our aunts and uncles had disappeared shortly after dinner and then deciding if they fit the description of our Santa for the night. After Santa left, we all sat and played with our new toys, compared our findings, and said, I knew it was Auntie Helen. That's weird, I've got an Auntie Helen as well. The Santa in today's story, however, started out as a Klaus. Jeffrey Pardo was born in 1964 and grew up in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles. His father was an engineer, and Bruce showed an interest in technology at a young age, with the LA Times reporting that he had a knack for mathematics. He was also charming and generous, was quick to make friends, and loved being the center of attention. He finished high school, attended the California State University's Northridge campus, where he studied computer science, and then landed a job as a software engineer at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Wait. So he kind of went to become a rocket scientist. Holy sh- Okay. According to his co-workers, though, Bruce wasn't very diligent or reliable employee. He was impulsive. He had a habit of bending the rules to suit himself. He would go on holiday on a whim, and he didn't take life very seriously. According to Tina Westman, his ex-girlfriend, he was like a big kid, goofy and lovable. He was very, very intelligent, but common sense lacking. Some very, very intelligent people are common sense lacking, aren't they? They're just like so bright that they're like, oh, no, I didn't think of that. <laughs> I was thinking about big brain stuff. I was thinking about the motion of frictionless objects through a vacuum instead of like manners, <laughs> this kind of thing. I've got a, I've got a friend of mine who's very smart, and he comes off as quite abrasive because he's just like, uh, he's just smart. <laughs> it's just like yeah, he doesn't really think about other stuff. <laughs> And Rachel Maxheimer, another friend of his, would say that Bruce was quirky and different, but a super nice guy. In 1988, the 24 year old Bruce got engaged to Delia, a co worker of his. He wasn't earning much at the time, and he was still living with his parents. And according to Delia, she ended up using her savings to pay for their wedding. They invited 250 guests, planned to hold the reception at a country club, and booked a honeymoon to Tahiti. Oh my god, did they say they didn't have much? <laughs> he might not have had much money or earnings, but she had a lot of savings. That is a massive wedding. 250 guests at a honeymoon to Tahiti. I don't even know where Tahiti is, but I know it's far away. Or maybe it's in the Caribbean, so it's not that far for an American. It feels far away for me. Is that where they get those torches? No, those are tiki torches, not Tahiti torches. <laughs> get on with it, Simon. But in the week leading up to the wedding, Bruce got cold feet. On the morning of the wedding, he withdrew the last $3,000 from their shared account and disappeared. Delia didn't hear from him until a few weeks later, and when she did see him again, he was tanned and he was looking good. Like, wow. Turns out he went to Palm Springs and blew all the money. Yeah, okay, I understand like him blowing the three grand or whatever is bad, but also that wedding must have cost tens of thousands, if not close to... That's got to be like a hundred grand wedding, right? That's a lot more that you've wasted. Those deposits and sh** is expensive. Understandably, the couple didn't get back together after Bruce had broken her heart and her bank account. But it didn't take Bruce long to get back into the swing of things. Bruce was a bit of a ladies' man, and he was always dating someone new. In 2001, also oh, sometime later, the 37-year-old Bruce moved in with his girlfriend at the time, Ellen Lucano, and their 13-month-old son, Matthew, and it seemed like he was finally going to settle down. That new year, Eleanor left Bruce in charge of watching Matthew while she went out. Bruce was watching television when he realized that Matthew was missing, and he found Matthew floating face down in the pool. He dove in and pulled his son out, and that's how Eleanor found them shortly after. A desperate Bruce clutching Matthew to him and screaming for help. Matthew spent more than a week in hospital, and according to Eleanor, Bruce never left his side. Oh my god, what are you doing? Why don't you, like, you, you've just got an open pool? That's insane. Like, you've got kids. I've got, I've, I've just built a pool at my house. It's not full yet, but it's still like, now it's just empty, so if they fell into it, it'd be even worse, because <laughs> it's like a big fall to concrete below. But like, we're obviously putting in a, a pool alarm. Like, you know, so if someone falls in the water, it starts going, woo, 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 you know? Or like back in the day, if they didn't have pool alarms, put in a fence. I think pool alarms are now like legally mandated in Europe. But then doctors told him them that Matthew was never going to recover. He had been too long without oxygen and he was left mentally disabled. Bruce struggled to process his guilt over the accident and eventually he and Eleanor broke up. According to Eleanor, he never went back to visit them and he never told anybody else about Matthew or what had happened to him. Dude, you piece of sh**. What the f**k? 
In 2004, Bruce was introduced to the 40-year-old Sylvia Ortega. She was divorced and had three kids of her own, and according to Rochelle Maxheimer, I thought maybe this is good for him, to go out with someone closer to his age with some children. He loved kids, so I thought it was a good thing. The couple got married on the 29th of January 2006, and together they bought a three-bedroom house in Montrose, Los Angeles. They shared the house with Sylvia's four-year-old daughter, got an Akita, that's a breed of dog, Simon, they, they named Saki. Okay, I didn't know what an Akita was. <laughs> it's like, that's a breed of dog, Simon, like condescending. And it's like, yeah, but when it comes to dogs, I need that condescension and became regulars at the Holy Redeemer Catholic Church, where Bruce became an usher. Bruce appeared to have calmed down a lot. He was still outgoing and generous, but he didn't seem as impulsive as he'd been back when he was 24. According to Jan Ditana, he was very outgoing, he was very friendly, he always greeted you with a smile, he was a pretty big guy, and had a firm handshake. Together, the Pardos projected the image of a happy family. But Bruce was keeping secrets, and they would eventually turn this clause into a Krampus. All I want for Christmas is a divorce. Hello all. While the majority of the rye, we're changing writer, are we? In this Christmas collective may greet you with an unabashed and jolly holiday cheer, I, the other Matt and self-appointed Scrooge of the group, offer only my sincerest bar humbug and in truth. I like this Christmas episode. Everyone's getting involved. It feels like a team effort <laughs> that suddenly I'm thrown into, which is fun. And in truth, the only, that is the only appropriate way to introduce this section because Bruce's life will now be taking a sharp and irreversible downturn. As we touched on, <laughs> his kid drowned in a pool. Or like, so much so that he was in a coma and became mentally disabled. <laughs> and I know it gets worse, but that's... <laughs> it's, already, it's a downturn from something fairly bad happening already. And by fairly bad, I mean terrible. As we touched in in the previous section, throughout the first year of Bruce and Sylvia's marriage, the couple seemed relatively happy. Bruce was well-liked by Sylvia's family, and he was always made to feel welcome within their home. Likewise, Bruce's family, particularly his mother, had grown to like Sylvia as well, and the two of them would chat often. However, as the pair settled into married life, it quickly became clear that each of them held fundamentally different ideas about what it meant to be married. First, finances were a primary and a recurring point of contention. Although marriage typically means combining one's assets and shouldering one another's financial burdens, Bruce was not comfortable with this, and he refused Sylvia's request to open a joint bank account together. He preferred that they keep their finances separate, which Sylvia did not think was fair because her salary was less than one-third of Bruce's. Additionally, Bruce also expected her to pay for anything and everything related to raising their three children because he didn't believe that he should be responsible in any way. What the f***? <laughs> I don't understand. What's wrong with you, Bruce? What's wrong with your brain? Honestly, you would think that ironing out important details like these would have been a top priority before walking down the aisle, but apparently Bruce and Sylvia didn't think so. It does amaze me, like, that what people get into without really thinking things through. Like, I'm an ing uh, my brain is, like, very logically wired. My wife is also very logically wired. And, like, we obviously had these conversations when we got married. <laughs> Like, he was like, oh, we'll just see how it goes. Hey! And it's like, no. You think these through things through thoroughly. Like, me and my wife are thorough thinkers. Both were either too blinded by love or assumed that the other would give in to their wishes, which was a mistake because neither was willing to budge. Soon, this fundamental disagreement began pushing the union toward a breaking point. However, it didn't take long for another wrench to be thrown into their already dysfunctional marriage. In early 2008, Bruce's mother revealed the existence of Matthew, Bruce's disabled son, to Sylvia because she thought it was only fair that Sylvia knew about him. Surprisingly, this was yet another topic that Bruce had simply never brought up before. Sylvia then learned that Bruce didn't just want to avoid financially supporting her children, he was also avoiding paying for his own child. Oh, I'm sorry, Sylvia's children, um, they're not his children. Sorry. I totally missed that. I lost my place. <laughs> Good job, back boy. Bruce was not sending Eleanor any money to help raise Matthew. Yeah, as you already pointed out, it's not cool. Dude, like, what the f***? Is, isn't he still, like, working at um, JPL? Like, he's a big brain scientist engineer. And it might not be the best paid job in the world, as we said earlier. But I imagine it's quite well paid, especially after he's been there. Or he's been doing this a long time. Like, time has passed. It's been, what, 10 years? He was, however, still claiming Matthew as a dependent on his own tax returns, which I believe is something that the federal government <laughs> refers to as tax fraud. Uh-oh. Most people just call it a major dick move. Yeah, it's both of those things, isn't it? 
Not long after this revelation, Sylvia filed for a divorce on March 24, 2008, citing irreconcilable differences as the main reason for her decision. And this is when Bruce's life truly began to fall apart. Despite being married for less than a year and a half, Bruce was utterly shafted in the divorce. Oh no! Oh no! Bruce, you were? What a shame! Because you're such a stand-up guy! As the primary breadwinner, he was ordered to pay Sylvia $1,785 per month in alimony while she was allowed to keep her wedding ring and walk away scot-free. Wait, why is that getting shafted? That doesn't sound so bad. It's like, he's the primary breadwinner. She's got dependents, which... Oh, they're not his dependents, are they? Or she was dependent on him? I don't know how this works. That that doesn't seem that bad, does it? Bruce was allowed to keep the family house, which was valued at over $500,000. However, because they had only paid about $100,000 of their mortgage, this is more of a liability than an asset. Well, not really, because he's got $100,000 in equity in it, and he's going to keep that, and he just has to pay Sylvia $1,700 a month? Like, it sounds like he's actually doing quite well. Am I missing something? His monthly payment was $2,700, which he then had to cover all on his own. To add insult to financial injury, the court also awarded custody of the family's beloved dog, Saki, to Sylvia as well. Wait. <laughs> this doesn't sound that bad. Wait, if I was in this position, and you're getting divorced, and they're like, yeah, 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 you can keep the house. We're taking away the dog. Oh, no. <laughs> like, good. And you'd have to pay Sylvia $1,800 $1, a month. And I'd be like, well, that's not too bad. And it's like, yeah, I'm paying for the mortgage, but like half of that's going to be going into equity, so it's not really that much. This doesn't sound like it, it sounds quite fair to him. Am I missing something? In July of that year, Bruce's financial hardships were further exacerbated after he was laid off by his employer for submitting fraudulent time cards. Oh, Bruce just loves a bit of fraud, doesn't he? As it turns out, Bruce had retained a streak of his impulsive side, and after Sylvia had left him, he had taken a month-long vacation to the East Coast without informing anyone at his company. Yet he had continued to bill for hours that he had not worked. Uh-oh! Unable to find a new job, Bruce then applied for unemployment benefits, but his application was denied. In a letter written to California's Office of Unemployment, he stated, I was not given a severance package from my last employer at termination, and I'm not receiving any other income. I'm desperately seeking work and have since applied to many companies, resulting in several job interviews. I ask for support just until I gain employment. Wait, why are you writing a letter? Surely it's just a form that you fill out. This isn't a qualitative thing, is it? It's like just, okay, you either get it or you don't. There's a box to check and either you meet the criteria or you don't, surely. It's not like, ah, oh, yeah, we'll give it to this guy, but not that guy. And this guy needs it, but that guy doesn't. That's not how the government works, is it? If it is, that's really worrying. He also went on to explain how Sylvia was using his money via alimony to travel the United States, stay in luxury hotels, and eat at five-star restaurants. What, not $1,800 a month, please? Whether this is true or not is unknown, but it is clear through his words that Bruce was exceptionally embittered by the court's alimony ruling. It just sounds like Bruce feels he got shafted. It doesn't sound that bad. By this point, Bruce was bringing in no money, was paying out over $7,800 each month, and his saving accounts was rapidly depleting. What's he spending seventeen? I'm like, something's wrong with my mask, because he's got $2,700 plus, let's say, even $2,000 for the alimony. So, well, it's like $4,500, let's say. That's actually a bang on, $4,485. And then, so he's spending like another three grand on living, which seems like quite a lot, but especially what, 10 years ago? What am I missing? <laughs> Despite this, he continued on, smiling at those around him, hiding the fact that he was facing financial ruin. But he was also hiding something else. Unbeknownst to his friends and family, Bruce had begun stockpiling guns and ammunition. Uh-oh. Most of these weapons he paid for with cash to make their purchase harder to trace. Then, on so oh, America. You just go in, it's like, I'll take one gun, please. And they're like, here's a bill. <laughs> no ID, no nothing, no registration. Like, I get that you're allowed guns. That's fine. But how about we just, how about you just have to, you know, <laughs> sign some sort of book. Maybe have your name engraved on them or something. Come on, it's not that hard. Then on September the 8th, he reached out to one of his neighbors, Jerry Deot, who owned a small costume shop and said he needed to rent an outfit for a fast approaching children's birthday party. He wanted to borrow a Santa suit. A very bad Santa. Disclaimer, I wrote this section about the same time Matthew Markham wrote his. Uh, Matthew wrote the last section. Since then, it has been brought to my attention that Matthew and I have different readings on this case. Pop down into the comments and let us know who you think got it right. Ooh, spicy. Hello, it is me, Liam. Oh, hello, Liam. The basement's lawyer and guy who seems to have exclusively written for casual criminalists when talking either about horrific massacres or legal dramas. And it isn't a legal drama that we're talking about today, oh no. Now, at the beginning of everyone else's sections, they seem to have spoken about what Christmas means for them. As both a Brit and lawyer, though, I detest this demonstration of public emotion and passion, and instead, I'll do what I do best. I'll ruin Christmas for all of you. <laughs> 
somehow you and Matt uh, M have done the same thing. What do I do on Christmas? I just normally um, I go out like Czechs mostly celebrate Christmas on the 24th in the afternoon and the evening is when the gifts are exchanged and stuff. So normally we'll go to we spend it. We've got a little house in the countryside. So we go out there and we spend like the week there. And then we have like a nice little Christmas, family Christmas. And then my wife's parents and her brother and sister-in-law normally come round, and I cook like a big Christmas dinner on the 25th and we all sit around and eat and drink. And we have crackers, which are not a thing in Czech, but it's like a nice little British tradition we have. We buy them. The crackers. Americans, do you have crackers? They're like these things which you, they sit on the table and then they're like a little, how do you describe a cracker? It's like, I, it's cardboard wrapped into a tube and then you hold both ends of it with someone else. You, someone, you hold one side, someone else holds the other and you pull on it. And then whoever gets the, there's a prize in the tube and someone is left holding on to the prize. This is very hard to explain. <laughs> Describe crackers. <laughs> so instead of my thoughts on what truly is a bottom tier holiday, let's instead speak about something I saw on social media earlier today. You see, recently, Factboy made it me his community manager. That's right. Yes, community manager, because we have an official Discord, which uh, I'll link to below. There's like thousands of people in there now, which is dope. Um, and we talk about things. The writers in there are in there. I do like live Q and A's and live streams in there. It's fun. Join us. Meaning now I have to actually engage with you all on the social medias. As part of my new duties, I was looking into TikTok, an app that I shall never look into again for any purpose beyond giving me a topic to rant about. I like. I think TikTok's very compelling, but. I'm, a, I'm nervous about TikTok. Like, all those governments are like government people can't have TikTok on their phone, which makes me, like, think I shouldn't have TikTok on my phone because if they're worried about spying, I'm worried about spying, like Chinese spies. And I know it seems a bit paranoid, but I'm like, I don't want that on my phone. So if someone sends me TikTok, I always look at it on my computer <laughs> in the browser. It was while scrolling through the so-called law talk that I came across an individual who was trying to raise everybody's festive spirits. The person was pointing out that each year since basically forever has been a host to the lowest divorce rates of any other time of year. The TikToker seemingly of the view that such was a symptom of how magical a time of year it is. Well, she's wrong. You see, a few years ago, I just started work in a family law firm in which I specialized in divorce cases involving children. I started around mid-December and was immediately surprised there were literally no cases open for me to work on. Confused, I approached my boss and asked if she wanted to cover any of other case, any other cases because with the current remit of my job, she was basically paying me to just sit in the reception area, typing gibberish on my laptop to make new prospective clients think that I was busier than I actually was. It was in response to this that she gave me the cryptic response of, wait till January 2nd and then see if you want more work. With that, I went around my business of making at least a few hundred pages of gibberish, with even a few starting to make it into some of my early scripts really nice, <laughs> while I patiently waited for the mystical January 2nd. Now, I remember January 2nd very well, since I had made the mistake of forgetting to mute my phone while I slept, so I was awoken to the sound of a pregnant sheep self emoliating itself. What? I soon worked out that this sound was actually my phone trying to notify me of the 26 different emails that had come into my inbox between 7am and 7.05am, every single one of them a new divorce client. Yeah, I can believe this, because people are like spending more time around their family in winter, their extended family, they drink, they, you know, they get into fights. I totally can imagine this. With this, I rushed to my boss to ask her for the winning lottery numbers, still unsure of how she'd foreseen this one coming. It is then that she imparted me the wisdom in which I now wish to impart onto you. Late December is the quietest time of year for divorces, not because Christmas is magical and heals all wounds. It's the quietest time, because when busy dealing with their children and arguing over which in-laws to visit, parents can't be asked to add a divorce to their to-do list. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, Christmas. January 1, New Year's resolution, get divorced! Yes! That is why, each year without fail, December has the lowest rate of divorces and January has the highest. So you may be thinking, okay, Liam, fascinating tangent ruining the magic of Christmas, but what relevance does this actually have to the case? Well, in the same way that Christmas is a disguise that hid the inner hatred and resentment from that TikToker, the dubious antagonist of this show would find a similar disguise. Disclaimer 2! Okay, now we're actually about to speak about the massacre. I have to put this here as I do need to discuss a certain level of detail to inform you of what happened. I've tried to keep that level of detail to a minimum, but please be aware of what's about to come. You see, on the 24th of December 2008, at around 10.30pm Pacific Standard Time, Bruce Pardo would climb out of his car and make his way up a small path to 1129 East Norcrest Drive in Covina, California. 
Inside that house were 25 members of the Ortega family, people that Bruce wanted to hurt, people whose lives would be forever changed. Although if any of them looked out the window, they would not have seen the man who had had his divorce finalized only a week earlier. Instead, they would have seen Santa Claus! Santa Claus! Those were the words of Katrina Yusuf Polsky, Sylvia's eight-year-old niece, who had rushed to the door seconds after Bruce had knocked. We'll never know how this made Bruce feel, whether it reassured him that the Santa suit he was wearing had worked as a disguise, or whether it gave him pause for thought. In front of him stood an innocent child, a child unaware of the hatred the suit hid, a child unaware of the two handguns hidden in a present box that Bruce was holding. Barely a second later, the massacre would begin when he drew one of these handguns and shot Katrin right in the face point blank. Miraculously, the child would survive this injury with the bullet bouncing off her jawbone. Unfortunately, many members of her family would not be so lucky. Immediately after shooting the defenseless child, Bruce made his way deeper into the home, causing many members of the family to flee in terror, trying to escape to a neighboring property. However, two members of the Ortega family, Charles Ortega and James Ortega, 50 and 52 respectively, Bruce's brothers-in-law, didn't. They both rushed towards Bruce and tried to wrestle him to the floor, with James being shot first before Charles was executed or trying to dissuade Bruce from killing any more people. We know this level of detail thanks to Irma Chapa Ortega, first cousin of the family and one of the night's survivors. Irma would also describe how, even after being shot, each of the brothers would still try to grab Bruce, even when their life was leaving their bodies. They tried with all their energy to save their families. Charles and James Ortega are truly heroes we should remember from that night. Yet their actions were in vain, since we know that next Bruce would shoot an unnamed 16-year-old in the back as she tried to flee. Luckily, she would also survive her injuries. That was not the last shot fired that night, but it is the last shot fired at the house that we can know any detail about. This is because soon after that shot, Bruce began to make his way around the house, pouring gasoline wherever he went, probably with the intent that no evidence should ever survive that evening. It is because of this gasoline that we can never know in what order Bruce had executed the remaining family members. What we do know is that at the end of the night, the list of victims who had been declared either dead or missing included Alicia Sotomar Orta, 70, Joseph S. Ortega, 79, Alicia Ortega Oritz, 46, Teresa Ortega, 52, Sherry Lynn Ortega, 45, Michael Andre Ortiz, 17, Charles and James Ortega, as well as Bruce's main target, his ex wife, Sylvia Ortega Pardo. In total, the Ortega family lost nine people, all of Bruce's former in laws, ranging from his mother and father in law to his brothers and sisters in law. From there, Bruce made his way out of the blazing house, the screams of the innocent filling the otherwise quiet night. His plan had not gone as expected, though, since while leaving the house, he had been very badly burnt, with investigators later explaining that the Santa suit had seared itself into his skin. From there, Bruce drove 40 miles to his brother's house. Again, we'll never know what was going through his mind when he made his way there. Was he there to kill his brother, or was he going to hand himself in? Luckily, his brother and his brother's family were not at home, so we don't know. We do know one thing that went through his mind shortly after arrival, though. A 9mm bullet fired from one of his handguns that ended the pathetic life that was Bruce Pardo. Now, at this point, we return to that disagreement I mentioned in the very first disclaimer of this section. You see, there are many people who have described Bruce primarily as an ex-husband who lost everything over and over again and was subjected to an extremely unfair divorce, a man pushed to his limits who snapped and took nine innocent lives. I do believe this is a legitimate reading of what happened, but I still disagree with it. Why do I disagree with it? Well, let's take a second look at that Santa suit and some of the other evidence that was discovered by the investigators doing the post-mortem on the case. You see, I have a background in not only lawyering, but also criminological research, and a small bit in criminal profiling, and that Santa suit is one of the most interesting parts of this entire case. There are some who read it as a symptom of the broken man, an outrageous and ridiculous costume, one that is oxymoronic to his intent that night and further demonstrates almost a level of madness. That is not the reading I give to it, though. You see, as well as the Santa suit, it was also discovered that Bruce had a plane ticket bought and paid for to take him to Illinois, a ticket he bought with the intention of escaping justice for his crimes. Then we also have the list that was discovered in his belongings that led investigators to the conclusion that Bruce had far more targets than just the Ortega family that night. By all accounts, it seemed Bruce wanted to get away with his crime, not end the night with a bullet in his brain. So, how does this shape the Santa suit evidence in our minds? As well as being majorly weird to wear for a massacre, what else is a Santa suit? Well, that's right, it covers the entire body from head to toe, and even covers a large part of the face. Yes, yeah, a disguise. Now, I could have find details on Bruce's exact Santa suit, but depending on the variety, it may even provide a fat suit that could hide your bills. So now we have a second alternative. Bruce may not have chosen a Santa suit because he had broken and gone mad, but maybe he chose it because it was actually a pretty good disguise, an especially good disguise to wear on Christmas Eve. Um, 
Yes, but then why did he kill himself in the end? He shot himself in the head. That definitely seems like, you know, he intended to do that rather than drive to the airport and go to Illinois. When considered alongside the plane ticket, list of subsequent victims, and gasoline he'd used to destroy any evidence, and from the statements of investigators who looked into this case, it is my firm belief that the Santa suit was intended to be a pure and simple disguise, and Bruce planned to get away with his crime. Now again, at this point you might be saying, well, okay, Liam, so you can still plan out a massacre and intend to get away with it and have been pushed to breaking point. Those two things are not exclusive. Well, that's where we go back to my profiling history. You see, in killers who suddenly break, what we generally see is a very minor and almost complete lack of planning. It's not unheard of for there to be planning, but the presence of planning does open up the alternative. Then what we see in killers who break, especially those who break thanks to family circumstances such as divorce, is no intent to live beyond the remit of their crimes. Most killers who kill in those circumstances do so because they feel they have lost everything. Effectively, the crime is viewed by the killer as their final act before they off themselves. Isn't that exactly what happened, though? What we see in the Bruce Pardo case is a complete split from that second part. Yes, he did take his life in the end, but what we see is that was never his plan. As it was not a part of his plan, I'm not willing to take it into account when considering what pushed him into doing this. If it wasn't part of his plan, well, what, why did he shoot himself in the head? It's then we come to two other important details that I think expose how his mind worked. First, on that list of people Pardo wanted to kill was his mother, presumably for the reason that she had shown Sylvia sympathy throughout the divorce. Second, Matthew Lucano, the son of Bruce and his former girlfriend, who in 2002 was left face down in the pool. As a reminder, shortly after Bruce's son was gravely injured due to the fact that Bruce had failed to look after him properly, Bruce had run away, never contacted them again, and didn't even mention them to his new family. Each of these examples points to a man who valued himself above all others, a narcissist who was willing to spite anybody who made his life unpleasant or complicated. Bruce was willing to cut anybody out and eliminate anybody who threatened his quality of life. After all, if there was no Sylvia, then there was no person to whom he could be forced to make divorce payments. Now, I can't find any psychologists who have properly looked into this case, since most psychologists are too busy dealing with criminals who actually end up going to court. Despite that, probably based on my own experience in both dealing with disgruntled mums and dads going through a divorce, dealing with genuinely evil people, and people who were pushed to the limit, I am confident in saying that Bruce Pardo wasn't a man deserving sympathy who was pushed to his limit. Bruce Pardo was an evil, pathetic man who couldn't deal with the consequences of his own actions, and so when his lies were uncovered and he ended his marriage, he turned to violence, he turned to vengeance, and then when his ill-thought-out plan for vengeance went wrong, he couldn't deal with the consequences and ended his own life. Now, I appreciate that this definitely appears to be the minority view on this case, so I'll definitely welcome polite criticism of my view, but either way, let me know in the comments below. Yeah, I don't know, this seems pretty legit. My theory, I think, is pretty similar to Liam's. He put on a disguise, he thought he was going to get away with it, and then he's driving along and he's like, oh my god, what have I done? Boom, shoots himself in the head. Done. And before you go, I do want to mention one thing. In the end, I worked on over 150 divorces, and every single one of them sucked. I also have some clients who never made it to the end as they took their own lives, which is scarily common in these cases. Oh my lord. Just because I don't think divorce broke Bruce does not mean divorce doesn't break people. If you're somebody at home who's struggling with an unfair divorce settlement or dealing with the process, then please know there are people who care. Many people find it hard to speak about how they feel, but there is support out there for you, and there are people who can help you get back on your feet. Please never turn to hurting yourself or others just because you think there's no way out. I give you the legal Liam guarantee that there is a way out. Yeah, it's uh, like I said, it's, it's not, it's never as bad as you think. And even if it's really bad, it's not. It's there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. Like I don't know, we've all had things that are, that are hard, and it's just not worth it. It's just like talk to someone. You can talk to someone. I've got friends, a couple of friends going through pretty messy divorces, and it seems miserable but at some point it'll be done and they'll move on with their lives so that's that's nice like as rough as it is at the moment you know if it's if it's really bad then you know it's gonna gonna get better with time eventually and that, as they say, is that. I truly hope you enjoyed the nice surprise that we set up for you and the viewers of this script. Yes, I did. Thank you so much. I want to thank Emma, Matthew, and Liam for their hard work for piecing this script together with me. It took a good bit of work and discussion, but I believe it turned out rather well, even if the subject matter is anything but merry. Bruce Pardo, as Liam so rightfully put it, was a sad, miserable, pathetic evil man, one who simply refused to take responsibility for anything, even at the end, when he gave himself the old goodbye and good riddance. I believe the Derma Chapa Ortega said it best several days after the travesty. He wanted to kill everyone, even his own mum. A monster. A monster. That man was a monster. He killed good, hard-working people who had many friends and loved the United States. So now, as the snow falls around us, 
and the darkness pulls back from us again. I once more wish to take a moment to remember the victims of this terrible rampage, a loving family who simply wanted to enjoy the holiday season, only to have it all ripped away from them by a vile coward in a red suit and a beard. Sylvia Ortega Pardo, Alicia Sotomayor Ortega, Joseph S. Ortega, Charles Ortega, Sherry Lynn Ortega, James Ortega, Teresa Ortega, Alicia Ortega Oritz, Michael Andre Oritz. May you rest in peace, and all the best wishes to those who survived, but were no doubt scarred by this atrocity. Especially Katerina Yusuf Polsky, who at the time was merely an innocent eight-year-old girl, excitedly opening the door for Santa, happy to see him, and wanting to enjoy the presents she thought he was bringing to her and her family. And with that, we'll try and end on a happier note. It's the holiday season, and it's meant to be a time of joy, not murderous, cowardly humbugs. So everyone, bundle up nice and warm, go have a snowball fight with your friends, build a snowman, go sledding in the snow, listen to some carols, enjoy some eggnog by the fireplace, and decorate the Christmas tree. Put out the evil from your mind, remember those gone fondly, and cherish these times with those you love. You never know when it will come to an end, and so each moment should be treated as precious as they are. That's not cheerful. <laughs> oh my god, I was reading this. I've been reading a lot of Hemingway lately. And I just finished this book, A Farewell to Arms. And it's like, what the f***? Like, I'm reading this book and I'm like, oh, it's turning it's, it's turning so nice. What a great ending to the book. This is such a happy ending. And then it's so happy that I'm like, oh God, he's going to do something horrible, isn't he? And the end of that book, I'm not spoiling anything. It's Hemingway, it's like 100 years old. It hits so f***ing hard. I was just lying in bed and I'm like, what? What? <laughs> it's not right. But it's an unbelievable book. There's this Hemingway quote from, I think it's from A Farewell to Arms, that's like, if two people love each other, there is no happy ending. And it's like, ah, oh, why? <laughs> why would you say that? Dismembered Appendices 1. From Liam I'm fairly used to writing cameos at this point, but tag teaming a script like this was not any fun, but also hopefully interesting for you guys as well. From Matt, number two. If folks are wondering how I got the first part of this title, well, it just happens that Silent Night, Deadly Night is an actual Christmas horror film series. The first film, Silent Night, Deadly Night, was released on November the 9th, 1984, and you guessed it, it follows the insanity of a killer slasher Santa Claus causing havoc in a small town. It went on to spawn five sequels. Number three. Dear Simon, we've compiled a small Christmas wish list for all the writers and editors trapped down here in the basement. A new heater for Lorelei because the old one melted Loris's face off. <laughs> an espresso coffee machine for Kevin. Ooh. I like Nespresso coffee machines, a new whiskey decanter for David, a red lamp for Emma's plants, an oak barrel for Danny's mushroom wine, a new gaming PC for Ilza, a kitty for Catty. A ki <laughs> what did I just say? A kitten for Katie. A barrister wig for Liam so he could constantly remind us of the fact he's a lawyer. <laughs> It's like that Mitchell and Webb sketch. Have you guys seen that? Where he's like, there's the guy and he's like, every excuse he gets, he's like, oh, like he'll ask someone what they do and it's like, oh. Well, it's not quite brain surgery, is it? <laughs> I could do with an accountant. Filling in those tax forms can get really confusing, can't it? Still, it's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> and they're like, oh, what do you mean? It's like, well, I'm a brain surgeon, and what you do isn't quite brain surgery. <laughs> and then at the end, the punchline of it is very funny, and at the end, another guy comes to the party, and he asks him, what do you do? And he's like, I'm a brain surgeon. And the guy's like, brain surgery? <laughs> Not exactly rocket science. Isn't it? And that's where we end today's episode. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Merry Christmas and join that Discord server. There's a link below. And uh, I'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>